Welcome to the essentials of using a flagpole as an HF antenna. Over the years, Joe Ham here has seen many changes in amateur radio, from spark gap transmitters to ham satellites and to computer-based digital modes and station automation. But perhaps one of the least welcome changes has been the restrictions that have been put on ham antennas recently, especially big ones. How many of us has a QTH that looks like this one with lots of room and no nearby neighbors? Many of us live in urban homes like these, or as I do, in a mobile home. Where is the space here for an antenna? especially a big one. But even worse, as this billboard points out, many also have the deadly homeowners association. HOAs often totally forbid outside antennas and sometimes even radio transmitting of any kind. And even if we don't have an HOA, there are the neighbors and the NIMBY syndrome. Don't put that ugly thing in my backyard. It's little wonder then that an HF antenna disguised as a flagpole is becoming increasingly attractive to many hams. But as great as the idea of a flagpole as an HF antenna might sound, the right design is not as easy as many may think. This is my mobile home and my HF flagpole antenna. It was on this very lawn that I began asking myself, what is the right design for an HF flagpole vertical? The first issue, as I stood there, was immediately obvious. There was no room for radials. What was I going to do? tear up all the nice landscaping my wife had created on our small lot? Yet, what good, I then thought, is a vertical without radials? There is a common belief among hams to this day that verticals must have radials. They go together, as the Frank Sinatra popular song of the 1950s concluded, like a horse and carriage. This widespread opinion very likely came from the work of this man, Dr. George Brown. He was commissioned in 1937 by the FCC to find out how many radials the vertical quarter wave length antenna of an AM broadcast station needs. 120 was his conclusion, and it became the FCC standard. Radials also got stuck then in the thinking of the ham community. As a result, this is how many hams continue to picture an HF vertical antenna. It should be, in their view, a quarter wavelength monopole, like an AM radio station antenna, set over a large array of ground radials. Though as recent research has shown, only 16 radials are needed at HF. Radials at MF for an AM broadcast station only improves soil conduction, but in the ground at HF, much of the field still exists, and the RF currents easily return to the vertical half of the antenna via only 16 radials. Here then is my list of essentials for an effective, stealthy HF flagpole vertical. It has no radials. It is just a plain pole without tuning coils, stubs, traps, or capacity hats. It has no guy cables, but is freestanding. The feed line is not visible, and it works all HF bands and six meters. Here is the design. It is an electrical half wavelength doublet, not a quarter wavelength ground plane. It is made from a plain aluminum pole typically two inches in diameter, 
and it has two insulators, one at the base, another at the feed point. In other words, it must be insulated from ground, like the ends of a horizontal dipole. It freestands in a ground support tube. The feed line runs coaxially up through the bottom tube to the feed point for a non-visible feed line. HF verticals without radials were pioneered by Cushcraft with their R-series antennas. The current model is the R9. High gains offering is the AV680. MFJ and others have comparable versions. Some hams, however, may not trust no radial designs. Some see them as little better than a dummy load. This is a myth. But to prove this to myself, I ran an easy neck simulation on the 20 foot no radial flagpole over average soil and then a comparative simulation on an identical 20 foot plain pole over 16 equal length 20 foot radials. Easy Neck Pro 4 models radials very well. I was surprised to find, as can be seen here, that a half wavelength no radial design at the top is actually superior. The plain pole with an array of radials at the bottom is noticeably down. This is due, notably on the lower HF bands, to the radials being too short to act as an adequate counterpoise. But the main challenge, I realized, is how to effectively feed an antenna of this design. There may seem to be two ways to feed a plain pole flagpole. One is with a tuner in the shack, followed by a run of coax connected directly to the flagpole. The other is to locate the tuning right at the base of the antenna, usually in the form of a remote automatic antenna tuner. Further research showed me that tuning at the base is the only truly suitable way. This is very important, for if tuning is performed in the shack followed by a run of coax, there will be very high loss in the feed line caused by high SWR reflected into the feed line by the antenna. Tuning at the base eliminates this loss. Here is the correct configuration. We use a short length of 450 ohm open wire window line to connect the ballon to the feed point. The window line enters through a slit in the base insulator and runs up inside the bottom section of the doublet. Commonly called coaxial feed, this method is less visible than a classical sideways feed. Plastic spacers, seen in the feed point detail on the right, keep the window line centered in the lower pole section. For ruggedness and ease of installation, the individual wires of the window line are butt spliced to two short 12 AWG stranded insulated wire pigtails just before the feed point. The individual wires exit on opposite sides of the feed point insulator and attach to the upper and lower doublet sections with stainless steel sheet metal screws. Some may ask why I chose a height of 20% for the feed point. It is largely arbitrary. Vector network analysis shows that placing the feed point at that height yields a somewhat easier range of feed point impedances for the auto tuner across all HF bands, and it is an easy height to reach. Some may question running open wire line through metal tubing. It might seem counter to common ham wisdom but open wire transmission line works very well inside metal tubing, as well as in a number of other situations, often considered unsuitable by most amps. Read my article that was in the August 2018 issue of QST.
But because it is so very important, let's now be sure that we clearly see in a little detail the main reason why a tuner at the base is really the correct way to feed the flagpole. In a few words, this is it. The flagpole is a non-resonant antenna. But what's a non-resonant antenna? Are you sure that you know? If you're not sure, don't feel alone. Many hams do not know the difference between a non-resonant and a resonant antenna. This is indeed undiscovered country for many hams. In fact, these two famous radio pioneers, Nikola Tesla and Guglielmo Marconi, didn't know either. No one then did. So it's not strange that some hams today still don't. Here's proof that Marconi didn't understand. This is the massive non-resonant antenna that he erected in the UK and used to send three dots across the Atlantic by radio in 1901. He put up this monster simply because no one in that day really knew much about antennas. They only knew to put up as much wire as possible. They did not know then that there was a simple formula known to most hams today, of how much wire to use. Here's a passage from a recent book on the history of radio. In 1909, Marconi was surprised to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. He frankly admitted that he still did not fully understand why he was able to transmit across the Atlantic, only that he could. As he put it, Many facts connected with electric waves still await a satisfactory explanation. This was particularly true for antennas. Ironically, had Marconi understood the difference between a resonant and a non-resonant antenna, a simple 80-meter dipole like the one here that any ham can buy at a ham radio store today would probably have worked better than his giant non-resonant creation. In contrast, in that resonant antennas soon became the norm for radio, hams today tend to only be comfortable with resonant antennas. It is the kind we most often buy. And with them, achieving satisfying performance is simple. Just connect some coax, tweak the SWR and the frequency, and away we go. But it's not that simple with a non-resident antenna like a flagpole. To see why simply, let's look at a different non-resident ham antenna, one that has also attracted many followers due to its excellent performance, a 43-foot vertical set over 16 43-foot radials in average soil. Here is its SWR curve across the HF bands. Notice the violet line. It divides its operation into two modes, resonant and non-resonant. Virtually all antennas have these two modes. But notice here that only on 5.5, 17, and 28 megahertz shown in red, is a 43-foot vertical over radials, a resonant antenna. On the ham bands, shown in blue, it is non-resonant, very much like the flagpole. The vital point here is, only on the red frequencies can this antenna be fed directly with coax. On all others, a tuner or some other matching network must be provided at the antenna. Now further, consider the two commercially available no radial HF verticals. How, you might ask, do they get away without a tuner? Simple, the coils, stubs, traps, and capacity hats are the tuner. 
But when I was building my prototype, no vertical flagpole antenna, I saw that these antennas could not be used as a flagpole antenna. The neighbors would easily notice the extra hardware and would immediately know that this isn't just a flagpole. But what's important here is that the added hardware performs the same function as the base tuner for the flagpole. Either one, coils and traps, or a remote automatic antenna tuner is necessary. A non-resonant antenna must be tuned and matched. We now come to the most important issue in this presentation. It's the big cruncher. Both current flagpole owners and prospective owners need to grasp this especially, or disappointing performance may result. These are the feed point impedances and SWRs by band of the 20-foot flagpole measured with a vector network analyzer calibrated for the feed point. Notice that, except on 17 meters, where the flagpole is near resonance, that the feed point impedance is nowhere near 50 ohms and that the SWR is unacceptable on all ham bands. This actually is typical of any antenna operated at other than resonant frequencies. This chart I compiled from the VNA data. It dramatically shows the loss that will take place in low loss LMR 400 coax connected directly to the flagpole for lengths up to 100 feet. Smaller coax is far worse. The flagpole itself is an efficient radiator of RF, but if one feeds it from a tuner in the shack through coax connected directly to it, SWR loss in the coax will be unacceptable in most cases. Here's another look at this issue, this time for 50 feet of RG8 with no tuner at the base only as a compromise on 20, 17, and 15 meters might a base tuner not be essential. Closer to the natural resonant frequency of the antenna, roughly 18 megahertz, the loss is somewhat more modest, but on the other bands, it is severe. This data should also be taken only as a rough guide, for individual surroundings can easily make a big difference This is one of the currently available remote automatic antenna tuners that works satisfactorily with the flagpole. Here's the one I personally use. It has a superior weatherproof outdoor case. The small box to the right is the in-shack control unit. As for most remote auto tuners, it uses a bias T network to send both RF and 12 volt DC power through the feed coax to the tuner. Now, finally, a word about balance. In my view, most antennas profit from a balance, but for the flagpole, a balance is essential. That's because the rig in your shack, the coax feeding the tuner, and the tuner itself operate with their shield or case grounded, or as it is typically said, unbalanced. The antenna, however, being an insulated from ground, half-wave, off-center fed doublet operates in balanced or non-grounded mode. Here again, we see the correct configuration for the flagpole and also a suitable ballon. It is a one-to-one -one ferrite current choke ballon made by placing ferrite sleeves over a short length of coax connected to the output of the tuner. The tuner is grounded. Most commercial one-to-one -one ferrite current choke ballons or toroid ballons are satisfactory 
Just be sure it is a current ballon and not a voltage ballon. Voltage ballons perform poorly at high SWR. Paired with a modern remote automatic antenna tuner, the attractive HOA and neighbor-friendly all-band no-radial HF flagpole antenna is these days becoming attractive to urban hams and those with HOAs. Many who may have wondered if their HF days are over simply because of where they now live have chosen the stealthy flagpole antenna to again enjoy real DX from a small urban lot. Here are a few examples of actual satisfied users. <laughs> 